It is an honor to present the next speaker, Dr. Claire Donnellan. She's a consultant gastroenterologist in Leeds. Her main areas of interest are nutrition, pelvic radiation disease, and uh, immunotherapy-related colitis. And today she'll be talking to us about immunotherapy-associated colitis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about what is immunotherapy today, talk about my first experience of immunotherapy-induced colitis, and then talk about the different presentations that immunotherapy can lead to, as well as a little bit about the BSG endorsed guidelines. So immunotherapy is also termed immune checkpoint inhibition. Essentially, what we're trying to do is block the inhibitory processes of the immune system, allow the immune system to be upregulated, and then the patient's own immune system kills the cancer cells. The key point that's different to normal chemotherapy is that chemotherapy is targeted at cancer cells, whereas this can affect the whole body. So it can affect multiple organs, including the gut. Put simply as a cartoon formation, if you have a tumor that normally blocks a T cell, that stops it from being activated. If we can stop that process via monoclonal antibodies, that, allow the, that allows the T cells to be upregulated. So there are three main pathways that are currently blocked. The anti-CTLA-4, which is cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen 4. Ipilimumab, which is the main drug that affects this area, was one of the key drugs that changed the face of melanoma therapy and revolutionized outcomes. Anti-PD-1 program death. Nivolumab and pembrolizumab are often used now in conjunction with ipilimumab, again part of the melanoma strategy, but also used in non-small cell lung cancer, in renal cancer, and more on the horizon. And anti-PD ligand-1 drugs, which are used mainly in urothelial carcinomas and also Merkel cell tumour. So my first experience was some nine years ago when I happened to be on call. I was phoned by the oncologist about someone with diarrhoea. And she had been part of one of the key trials that randomised her to receive either ipilimumab or placebo. Now, clearly, she had ipilimumab, but we didn't know that at this time. And importantly, the dose, uh, the, the dose of the drug that she was given was 10 milligrams per kilogram, which is far higher now than the 3 milligrams per kilogram that we use. So her story was that she'd had three doses. She'd had what she thought was gastroenteritis, but then became worse with abdominal pain and swinging fevers. When I reviewed her, she didn't look that well. She was dehydrated. She was in pain and had some generalized tenderness. And her blood tests were worrying. By the time I reviewed her, her CRP was rising uh, up to about 150. We arranged a CT scan in view of her abdominal pain, which confirmed a pancolitis with no complications and a normal small bowel. And an urgent flexible sigmoidoscopy showed colitis. But remember, at this stage, we didn't know which drug she'd received. And the histopathologist couldn't differentiate between ipilimumab-induced colitis and new IBD. She was already on oral prednisolone, so after discussion with the trial coordinators, we switched her to IV methyl prednisolone, so a higher dose of steroids, and actually she seemed to settle and was able to be discharged. Unfortunately, she was readmitted 10 days later with worsening symptoms already on a good dose of steroids. We restarted the IV methyl prednisolone at one milligram per kilogram. But in those two words, trial and blinded, you can imagine there were several hours of conversation between us and the trial coordinators, but it turned out that she was on ipilimumab. She had a repeat flexible sigmoidoscopy, which showed worsening appearances now with punched out ulcers. And the biopsies were then diagnosed as ipilimumab induced colitis, although this was the first step that our histopathologist had seen. Again, she settled rapidly on the IV steroids, but it was clear that she was going to relapse. So after we looked at the literature, that was quite quick, there wasn't very much out there, and discussed with the trial coordinators, we gave her infliximab. Now remember, this was in 2011, and at the time, the only infliximab I'd been, I'd been given patients was those with IBD who had no oncology history or no recent oncology history. So it felt like quite a scary thing to do. She settled really well clinically, but unfortunately, on the day of discharge, she was breathless on moving around the ward. I'm not sure how well that projects, but there's clear air under the diaphragm, and she perforated. She had to go for a subtotal colectomy, where there are actually two sealed perforations, and although she had a slightly stormy course post-operatively, post she did settle and was able to be reversed six months later. 
So how did she do in terms of oncology? Well, very well. So she had three years of cancer-free survival. She then developed neck and lung nodules, uh, went on to pembrolizumab post-surgery, and she remains on this. And she's still alive to this day. And despite the complications of that initial ipilimumab, I do believe that she wouldn't be alive if she hadn't been in that trial. She does have skin issues, and she's on steroid replacement for her adrenal insufficiency. So let's look at her trial. Remember, this was the high-dose ipilimumab that we didn't, don't normally use now. Uh, this was a trial randomizing those with stage 3 melanoma to either ipilimumab or placebo. 41.4% of patients had diarrhea. And if you look at the grading that they use, CTCAE is what the oncologists use to grade all of their side effects. And it's a common terminology, uh, adverse effect uh, data that they use. Uh, even the grade 2 diarrhea is four to six times more than baseline. So although they call it just grade 2, I think in the gastroenterology world, we'd call that quite a severe adverse effect. 15.8% of patients in this trial had colitis. And again, I think they downgrade the severity of colitis compared to how we would uh, grade equivalent patients with IBD. So after that trial, they did dose findings data, and they started to use a three milligram per kilogram a dose that we now use. And this was the next big trial that looked at outcomes and adverse effects. So this was a trial that compared either patients with ipilimumab plus a peptide vaccine, or either one of those alone. And again, you can see that most of the side effects are being led by ipilimumab, with 27 to 30% of patients developing diarrhea, and five to 80% of patients developing colitis. Increasingly now also we use combination therapy with ipilimumab and either nivolumab or pembrolizumab. And the data there again is very much led by ipilimumab. So in those getting macroscopic colitis or those getting diarrhea, it's 69% in the IPI groups either on your own or combination. And for colitis, again, 7 to 9% of patients. So when does diarrhea occur? Well, supposedly it occurs after a median of four to seven weeks but actually I've seen it after one dose, and we've had one patient who was several months down the line before they developed diarrhea. What about endoscopy data? Well, it's limited at the moment. There are only two large-scale uh, series, and even those are only about 300 patients. The two key things I want you to take away are that only a very small proportion have right-sided disease, so we can normally get away with doing a flexible sigmoidoscopy. And actually, a fairly significant percentage of patients have a normal macroscopic appearance. And there's interesting data coming out now, which has not been included in the guidelines yet, that actually immunotherapy can also cause microscopic colitis. So this seems to be more common with nivolumab and pembrolizumab rather than the IPI. It seems to be a longer time to onset in terms of months rather than weeks, more lymphocytic rather than collagenous. And importantly, in these patients, they may be able to go on to be desinide and continue their immunotherapy. Whereas if you have a macroscopic colitis and you need strong drugs or you have grade three or four symptoms, often you have to stop your immunotherapy. So you're not expected to read this, but this is just to highlight the most recent guidelines uh, produced in the Lancet and published in July. The left blue side is the investigation and the right, blue, the right green side is management. So the management is very much what we're used to dealing with with IBD, with the exception is, as well as doing all the normal stuff, stool cultures and urgent flexible sigmoidoscopy, you have to think about thyroid gland because that's often affected by the immunotherapy. And if it's normal, think about a colonoscopy to look for that rare right-sided disease, or duodenal biopsies, as I've had at least one patient with villus atrophy, and then think about alternative diagnoses, such as bar salt diarrhea, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. In terms of management, the guideline is to start off with prednisolone 40 milligrams daily, and if there's a concern that the patients aren't responding, escalate this to IV methyl prednisolone, one milligram per kilogram. If there's, no, if there's a, a good response in three to five days, you taper like you would normally. But if there's not a response, or more commonly what I see is they initially respond, but as they're at home and their steroids are reducing, that's when they relapse. That's when we need to consider infliximab. I started off only giving one infusion, but actually by two weeks, you really don't know whether the infliximab is working or it's still their high-dose steroids. So I now tend to give infusions at naught and two weeks, and then in about 10% of patients, we need to give a third infusion. <laughs> 
The new guidelines say that if you're not responding at that point, you can consider vedalizumab. We're about to give our first patient vedalizumab, but we haven't given anyone for the last few years. And the paper also suggests mycophenolate or calcineurin inhibitors, but again, I haven't used these yet. You have to think about the basics as well, making sure that their VTE is up to date, thinking about nutrition because these patients can lose weight hugely quickly as they get food fear because they don't eat, and think about abdominal x-rays or other imaging if they develop abdominal pain. In terms of microscopic colitis, there's no clear guidelines at the moment, but increasingly we're trying to use the standard therapies that we would use outside of immunotherapy. Um, in about a third of patients still, they may need biologics, which of course we wouldn't normally do outside of this setting. But it seems to be that if you give immunotherapy, you can switch off the process, you give them that short course of infliximab, and then they don't need it in the future. And I don't quite understand that, but you seem to be a, a, able to switch it off with no adverse outcome for their oncology. So in conclusion, macroscopic colitis is a really serious side effect. For the current dose of ipilimumab that we use, the rates are about 5 to 10%, and there is still a perforation rate, although it remains quite low. Microscopic colitis is an emerging side effect, and I don't think yet we know quite how to treat it, but I would certainly try budesonide, try to continue on with their immunotherapy, and reserve biologics for those patients who don't settle. I think probably the most important thing for this audience is to have joint engagement. So we have a, a protocol that we use locally. Um, only recently we had to update our endoscopy protocol because these patients weren't getting a timely flexible sigmoidoscopy. For anyone receiving ipilimumab, they get quantifieron tests and other screening tests right at the start of their therapy. And that means if we need to then use infliximab, there are no further delays. And then doing the basics well, making sure they don't have an infection, making sure they have that um, urgent flexible sigmoidoscopy and CT if required. In terms of the future, vedalizumab is being used in some centres as first line, but hasn't been uh, endorsed by the BSG guidelines, just as second line. And in some centres, they are starting to think about trying to avoid the use of steroids uh, and give early infliximab. I personally don't think that's right yet, because a proportion of patients absolutely settle with just steroids alone, but it might be interesting to see what uh, turns up in the future. Thank you very much. So one of the questions from the audience was, in patients with mild symptoms of colitis, can the immunotherapy be continued? Yes, so um, it, the, guide, the, the guidelines are really strict for the oncologists, so uh, they are time pressured. So if they stop their immunotherapy, they have to restart it within a certain time limit. So if they've got grade one and grade two symptoms, they will try and manage them with steroids and restart the immunotherapy. If they've got bad symptoms and they've needed infliximab, then it's an absolute no-no. And that's why, particularly for the microscopic colitis, if we can get away with budesonide, settle them down, and then continue the immunotherapy, then that's a really good thing. Interestingly, on the oncology side, there appears to be evidence that the worse immune side effects you get, the better your oncology outcomes, and that makes absolute sense. So you can sort of reassure the patients that although you're stopping their immunotherapy, the process is ongoing and hopefully continuing to munch away at their cancer cells. May I ask another question? Oh, we have a question in the audience. Just very quickly. Thank you. I just have a question. Uh, fecal microbial transplant is not possible at the moment, but I think there was some comments to use it. Yeah, so I, I haven't used it, and it's not mentioned in the BSG um, endorsed guidelines, but I think uh, that probably will be used in many things in the future. Uh, we just don't have the evidence yet. So I've changed tax. So um, I was honestly uh, so nervous the first time I gave that in 2011. And I think um, as time has gone on, there seems to be a mismatch, I absolutely agree, between the severity of their symptoms and the severity of the findings. Yeah. 
question. Ah, sorry. Would you mind so, yeah. summarising Josh's first question? So Josh was just asking, um, uh, what do you do about the mismatch between symptoms and histological findings? Because as IBD specialists, you feel uncomfortable giving uh, biologics when there's very little disease. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and my answer is, when I first gave it in 2011, I was very anxious. Uh, as time has gone on, I've become less and less anxious. And there definitely seems to be a, a clinical switch so that um, I've now given it for people with minimal disease. They have to have histological information. So I've, got, I've got given it to nobody without any evidence of anything. But as long as they have histological information, if they are very symptomatic and struggling, I have given it. And every time I've given it in that setting, it's switched off. And then they've been fine. And I think that's probably a safer strategy than long-term steroids, which is the alternative that they end up on. So the question is, how do we consent patients for infliximab, given that the, it's acting on the T-cells and we're wanting the T-cells to work? Again, I think there's really good supportive data now showing that oncologically, uh, I don't understand why, but there appears to be no bad effect from infliximab. So I agree with you. Mechanistically, that doesn't make any sense at all. But it almost appears that uh, you're attacking the gut with the infliximab. And I know it's not gut-specific, but you are attacking the gut with the infliximab and all the other stuff going on in the body works because it doesn't have any benefit for the skin or the joints or the hepatitis or any of the other organs affected, but it does seem to help the gut. So I don't understand why, but I think it's safe. Can I ask one final question? So in the patients with a past history of inflammatory bowel disease or with a positive family history of inflammatory bowel disease, do these patients have an increased risk of immunorelated colitis? Uh, great question. Um, in those with inflammatory bowel disease, um, I haven't seen enough patients personally to know, have a feel for whether they get worse outcomes. But to date, I haven't seen anyone with immunotherapy-induced colitis who has IBD under us, but tiny, tiny numbers. So I don't think I know that. In terms of family history, that wouldn't bother me. So yes, there may be an increased risk, but then you're going to treat the immunotherapy with your biologics if they get to that stage, and then it still seems to switch it off, whether that's in the background or not. Thank you very much, Claire. So we'll be stopping for a short break, a coffee break, and then we'll be returning at three.